Hey guys, thanks for joining us on this YouTube seminar. My name is Maurice Anderson with the role of Page Signature Realty, and today we're gonna to be talking about generational wealth uh, with my mentor, business connoisseur, and tech savvy broker owner from Roll the Page, ever since COVID, obviously. <laughs> um, Mr. Chris Lightham. Thanks for having me today. No problem, no yeah, problem. Excited thanks for coming. To be here. Ah. Love talking real estate, so. Um, I, I do wanna ask you for anybody who doesn't know you personally, sure. to uh, let them know more about yourself, who you are. Oh, great, yeah, sure, yeah. We've been, my family's been in real estate since forever. We mm -hmm. started this uh, in the brokerage business in 1965, but before that, uh, they were in the building industry as well, building okay. houses and, and apartment buildings. Okay. And so we've been doing it a long time. And uh, I kind of got involved because I always, I was the kid who followed my dad to the office mm -hmm. when I was really little and I kind of knew what I wanted to do. And, and so I followed his footsteps and uh, here we are today, you know, 57 years later wow. and, uh, wow. and really, you know, enjoying the business. Did you enjoy going to the office as a kid? Is that when the... Yeah, that's yeah. when it all kind of wow. got, the, got okay. the bug, you know, the itch. Okay. I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. I want to I wanna be a part of this, what's going on. And so um, I've been excited about it ever since and, and uh, still love it today. So with it being a family business, I would, it would be safe to say that it is definitely a, a generational wealth and knowledge that was passed on from your, you said your father? Knowledge for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's great to be able to learn from my dad and my grandfather when he was around to uh, about the business, and oh, really? uh, and they always shared great nuggets of wisdom, and uh, and we continue to share those with uh, with others today. So the good thing is because I knew that you're going to be here. Obviously, I asked uh, I asked around my clients some questions that they wanted to great. get answered for me because I don't have the type of knowledge that you have, but. Uh, before we get into that segment, if there's one thing that you could think back from your grandfather or your father that they taught you, what would that thing be? Uh, patience. Patience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He, it's it's really real estate is is they always said from day one is you have to think of it in in many years mm -hmm. long term, and and that was one thing that always resonated with me because when you're you're young and you're thinking well I want to get going and I really want to do something. And, and you know, create an income for myself yeah. and, and uh, um, set myself up. And they said, just have patience. Okay. Because with, with real estate, the longer you own it, the better it gets. Yeah. And uh, it's tough when you're starting out or you're just thinking that you're trying to get in the market for the first time. Yeah. But just think of it in, in, in a longer, longer view of things, which is hard in this day and age when everything's so instant, we want it Very all true. right away. But uh, that was one thing that uh, always resonated with me and still does today. I, I, I'm gonna speak from a personal experience. I actually just found this out two days ago. I was in the uh, conference room uh, looking at properties and my mom called, you know, um, just having a regular conversation with her. Yeah. We used to live in Scarborough um, oh, yeah. in the Malvern area. Yeah. So off Military Trail, close to High Castle Public School. Yeah. Uh, we lived in a three bedroom townhome, which I thought we rented up until yeah. two days ago. I came to find out that my, uh, my grandmother actually helped my mom purchase that property. Okay. Back then, they didn't have to have a down payment because I think it was a, it was, if your credit was good enough, you'd be able to pr purchase a property yep. with ease. Yeah, a lot easier a than lot today. A lot anyways. easier than today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so those circumstances, times are changing. Uh, the mm -hmm. the evolution of real estate has also changed. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get into that right now, and I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. Okay? Absolutely. All right. So the first question I wrote it down. I didn't want to mess anything up here. No, that's all right. Uh, so what is real generational wealth? Is it having a property, selling it, and making a profit, or is there a different terminology that you would deem generational wealth? I think uh, generational wealth is created by by building a portfolio and keeping the real estate and passing that down mm -hmm. to the next generation. Okay, and then they can build on that success. Yeah, if you you can buy real estate and make a nice profit and sell it, and, and you have some really nice cash in your hands. Mm -hmm. But that's what do you then do with the cash? Right, that's the thing. Uh, when you have cash in your hand, it's really easy to spend it. Yeah, that's very <laughs> right? true. Right? On, on, Life on, happens, right? Exactly, yeah. stuff happens, right? And there's some really nice, fun stuff out there we could, we could all go and buy, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if it's invested in real estate, then it continues to grow. 
and you can if you have if you are able to you know create an investment property then you can get you know income from that property and then you can spend the income but you're allowing the equity and the property itself to grow over time. Mm -hmm. And so that really starts to, that's the wealth creator okay. effect of owning property for a long time. So as you mentioned, the key is to buy and hold. That's the And key. not to sell if you don't have to. Absolutely. But there's a lot of circumstances where I'm gonna be devil's advocate where yeah. you might have to sell. Yeah. In a situation like, uh, you know, it's a husband and wife together and they decide to get a divorce. Yes. Uh, and they decide to sell that property. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend, if they can, uh, maybe keep the property, buy one of the other individuals out, mm -hmm. so that way they could still have that home in the family and then pass it down. Or absolutely, you know, if the burden is too much, to scrap it and then yeah. sell it. Start fresh. Start fresh. Yeah, but if you can hold on to it, if one person can buy the other out, that's great. Yeah. You can hold on to it and then allow that to to grow on its own. Or sometimes you do have to sell it, but I'd hope that maybe if you take the equity from that house, each person then go and and hopefully are able to buy a property each uh, yeah, yeah. and then continue that, that story. Okay, okay. Um, on average, uh, we have known, based on the seminars that you do on a weekly mm -hmm. basis, mm -hmm. it's, it's ridiculous. I've never, <laughs> I've never been to a brokerage where, they have, where you guys have weekly informational sessions. Yeah. Uh, you taught us that on average, over the course of a decade, uh, the increase is around 6 to 7% on a conservative, conservative side. Yes. Um, in that respect, where do you see the market going? I know you don't have a crystal ball, yeah. but if you could, where do you see the market going in about 5 or 10 years? Well, I really do think we're going to see that continue in our marketplace because in the GTA, it's growing, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 well, Canada in general, we're going to be growing over the next decade because as our federal government has stated, they want to welcome over 400,000 people a year into the country, yeah. right? So if you have population growth, you have demand for housing. It's just built in growth for for housing right? yeah, yeah. so if that's if that is the story that continues i think we're going to see continual price appreciation but it it doesn't really it doesn't go up in a straight line mm -hmm. so we can't say look maurice you can count on six or seven percent every year for yeah. 10 years one you like this year uh we might have 13 percent mm -hmm. and next year you might have two percent and the following year, you might have 4%. And then another year, you might have 7 And one year, you might have negative 3 Yeah. And then the next year. So it kind of goes on a, on a bit of a, a roller coaster. But it goes, it generally over time, especially when you're talking on a 10-year timeline, yeah. you're more likely to say it's going to be higher in 10 years than it is today. It's tougher to say, is it going to be higher next year or the year after? Yeah. That's harder to say because there is where you have that kind of up and down to get to that higher number over time. That's true. And I, I think uh, based on the statistical information that I've seen, I've been in the business for eight years now, but um, before I was born, there was a crash in the 1980s, I believe. Yeah. It was, was it the dot com? Before bubble? you were born. Before, yeah. I, <laughs> before I was born, um, 88, <laughs> but it was still slightly before I was born. Yeah. Right? Um, the dot com bubble was the only time where it really took a massive dip in the market um, and affected the real estate values. Well, really, right. I think in your generation, we'll call it, uh, <laughs> the biggest dip was in 2008 in the global financial crisis. Okay. And that's where the market really did take a pullback. It was for a fairly short period of time on a relative basis. It was about a, an eight to 10 month decline. Mm -hmm. um, but Canada, you know, from a global perspective, did very, very well, yeah. even through that period. And then in 2017, there was a pullback as well when they introduced the 16-point fair housing plan Catherine here. Catherine right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, that does make a lot of sense, especially uh, with the, the rates going on average 6 to 7%. Mm -hmm. But over the past two years, I would say, since COVID, uh, that has not been the case, um, no. which, is, which, <laughs> which is an unrealistic correct me if I'm wrong, circumstance for it to continue on that trend. Agreed. So we just have to basically time the market as best as you can because it's not always best to jump in when you think the market's going to crash uh, because there's, as you mentioned, dips and rises mm -hmm. over that time period. Mm -hmm. So I was actually speaking to a client um, yesterday and the client 
mentioned that she wanted to purchase a couple properties. Okay. Uh, she just did a pre-construction property in Coburg. Um, and she contacted her bank. She's with TD Bank. Mm -hmm. And TD Bank advised her that she could only purchase about four properties mm -hmm. uh, with her portfolio. Mm -hmm. To my understanding, you are able to purchase more than four properties. You just have to find the right ways to do it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are not uh, knowledgeable on how to get that done. So are you able to elaborate on the steps that could be taken for them to potentially get more than four properties in their portfolio? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways of doing it. One is the banks, so, so the, theory, the, the, the theory behind that is banks are, they don't want to have too much exposure to one, mm -hmm. one person. And so one way to do it is in, in, the, in, the, in the residential side of the business, so yeah. individual houses. But they will, if you want to then get into commercial properties, which is defined as three units or more by okay. the bank standards, okay. then you move over to what they call the commercial division of the bank, and lending uh, requirements are different on the commercial side. So yeah. if you go into a commercial property, which is three units or more, or a, a retail store or an office you know, unit or a small industrial unit, that's a commercial... Um, that's a commercial uh, type of property, mm -hmm. and the banks will actually lend more, add, allow you to add more to your portfolio. Okay. The other way to do it as well is sometimes credit unions mm -hmm. are happy to loan, like EQ Bank, uh, for example, like or, yeah, I think well, EQ Meridian. Bank might or Meridian. Uh, other other lenders would would allow you to go beyond the four units. Okay. So you're able to get the four with TD potentially and then yep. move on to another move institution on to another or credit union. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Or move into, once you've reached those four of maybe single uh, residential properties, then move on to commercial properties. Okay. That's actually a great segue to the next question. I think mm -hmm. you do have a crystal ball. <laughs> but, uh, so I was speaking to uh, another client, yeah. apart from that one, yeah. in this situation, they were looking to be, purchase their first property, so they never bought before, first time home buyer. Mm -hmm. uh, so the two options that we were discussing was they would purchase their first primary residence, mm -hmm. uh, regular residential property. Yes. The second option was potentially getting a triplex, fourplex, mm -hmm. or a duplex first, because mm -hmm. uh, they do have 20% down. Great. And then after you know, they have some equity, maybe after a couple of years, they then move on to purchase a regular home. In that situation, would that be affected with the financing from the institutions that you were just talking about? Or is that a good way to start? It's a great way to start. I love that plan. Yeah. Because I'm, I, I believe what they would do is they would move into one of the units in the exactly. triplex. Yeah. That's absolutely a fantastic idea mm -hmm. because you can buy a little more, a little larger property and yeah. value because you have the income from the other units mm -hmm. that are going to support it. And the income from the other units will pay most of your costs. Yeah. So your cost of living actually could be less than buying your own single family property. You've bought a bigger property, you've bought something that's giving you cash flow and income, mm -hmm. or, or in, maybe not cash flow per se, but income to help pay for your costs, which means you can save more money because you're not having to use that to, okay. of your yeah. own you know, income that you're making in your regular job. And you can build another down payment faster. Quicker. To get on, so that is absolutely a brilliant, brilliant. Strategy. Potentially, uh, what I'm hearing is, if the down payment is good enough, the cap rate is also sufficient, uh, low enough. They may be living rent free compared to where it. they were living before, where they have to pay somebody else's rent. That's right. To a property management company or, you know, a homeowner. That's right. right? That's right. Okay. And if they owned, even if they owned their own house, they're having to pay their own mortgage. That's true. But if uh, if you're in a triplex, which you own, and the other tenants are paying most of your costs, the extra money that you're not having to pay your own mortgage or pay rent somewhere else, yeah. you're saving that. And as long as you don't have too much fun spending it, you save it up. Yeah, you're going to have another down payment. Well, that's quick. An, that's another topic for another time. Because if you <laughs> have too much money and you never trained with discipline to save that. That's a whole different ballpark, it a is. whole different conversation. It is. So if somebody's going to be purchasing a property for themselves mm -hmm. and they want to start that pathway, is subways, transit, highway access important to that goal to make uh, generational wealth possible? Yeah, when you're looking at rental properties, for sure, access to transit mm -hmm. and access to a job market yeah. are two really, really, or schools. Okay. 
where where because you you tend to have really good um, you know demand for tenants in mm-hmm. those types of areas. So if you're close to let's say uh, you know in our area, University of Toronto, yeah, or uh, George Brown College or yeah. Ryerson. Um, and there's different campuses. It doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be downtown. There's yeah. different campuses around the GTA. Uh, if you are close to transit, as you mentioned, or or um, as I just said, you know, uh, job areas where there's lots of jobs, uh, anything like that is great. Okay. Um, but the key is getting started. Yeah. So I really encourage people to, you know, don't wait. You really, because the sooner, and that was another piece of information my dad and my grandfather said, the sooner you start, yeah. the sooner it gets paid for. Okay. So if you wait two or three or four or five years, it's going to take that much longer yeah. to get the property paid for. I mean, you make a good point, because when I got into the business eight years ago, it mm-hmm. was 2013, around there. Mm-hmm. Uh, prices were steady. Uh, yes, they were. It skyrocketed yeah. in 2015, 16. Mm-hmm. Kathleen, when, like you mentioned earlier, came out with a fair housing market plan, yeah. 16 point plan. And a lot of people at that point were saying it's gonna crash, let me just wait. Yeah. And now we're in 2020, one, 2022, sorry. Yeah. COVID, I lost track of years, days yes. and times. Agreed. Um, <laughs> uh, the average price now is almost $2 million. That's right. Right? Uh, back then, what was it, six, 700,000? That's right. Right? Uh, so hard to believe. Hard to believe, very, very hard to believe. And a lot of people, millennials, my generation, as you called it, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Gen Zs, they're going to have a difficult time uh, finding that first down payment to get into the market. With the advancement of internet and social media, access to information is readily available. And uh, money is also readily available for international buyers. Mm-hmm. Some people are thinking because Toronto is too expensive, or the GTAs ever since COVID, prices have gone up, you know, why not just purchase a property in Florida, Texas, Atlanta, where it's cheaper, you get more home, more land. Is Toronto still a good place to invest? I, I think so. I mean, it depends on, and, and maybe you have, maybe somebody has a connection to some of these other areas. Maybe there's family there. Mm. And so there's a really solid connection. Somebody could, you know, watch over the property for them or, or they find a great property manager. What I love about the GTA, though, is, and I mentioned it earlier, is Canada's in growth mode. Yeah. Right? So we're, we're going to be welcoming over 400,000 people a year for the foreseeable future and, and up to 500,000. I think they're trying to grow it towards if we can find places for people to live. Yeah. But what that means is, is, is you're going to have constant demand for housing, mm-hmm. which will bring that, those values up over time. So I know it's it's very difficult to get into the real estate market yeah. right now if you're just starting out and you're thinking, gosh, the average sale price in Toronto's, you know, over a million dollars, and I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. But you really do have to if you if you're really focused and get some money saved with the you know government programs that are available for first time buyers, and you know five percent down. Just get a small condo. Just get in the market, mm-hmm. right? And to your point, don't pay in a, uh, somebody else's rent. Right? Yeah. You don't need to pay a landlord their m- money because you're gonna arguably you have to live somewhere, right? And and generally speaking, you've got costs. Yeah. So just think about the fact that if if you can do your very best, live in mom's and dad's basement for a couple of years, whatever you can yeah. do, right, is to save and save and save as much as you can and then get into the market, buy a little condo, uh, something that, that's, that, that fits your budget, but it gets you started yeah. and gets you paying. Because every payment, every mortgage payment right now, close to 50% of that payment, you're actually paying the mortgage down Yeah, because interest rates are so low. Yeah. So that's another little secret about low about buying real estate right now. It's that forced savings plan. You're you're paying down that mortgage from that first payment. Yeah. And you it's amazing. Like you said, you've seen it in the last eight years where yeah. prices have gone. Yeah. And so if you add that on to the plus the fact that you're paying down your mortgage, now you're in the market. I mean, even to add to that point, while you're paying down to, to the mortgage while you're paying down the mortgage, the property value is still increasing at the same exactly. time, right? So you got the double whammy, yeah. right? You're paying down debt, which is creating equity, and the prices are going up. Five, six, seven years from now, you can sell that property and buy a, a bigger property. Yeah. Or you can refinance that property, put a tenant in that property, and take the equity out 
and go buy your next property. If you were to refinance a property, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't pay taxes when you pull money out of correct. your own property, right? That's right. Uh, so it's tax free. That's right. Unless, so if you were to put down 100000 when you first bought the property, wait about five years, take that money back out, and buy another property, you just reinvested none of your money really That's right. <laughs> into the new property. You so you're. It. Yeah, okay. Now you're growing. Right. I think I'm I think I'm getting it. Oh yeah. Just, just I know you got it. <laughs> Actually going to your point before we go to the next question, you mentioned that we have about four hundred thousand people coming to Canada. Uh, Trudeau during his last political election mentioned he wants to build about one point five million homes, I believe in the next four years, which is around the same time you guys were elected. Mm -hmm. um, do you <laughs> do you believe that would even be sufficient with the demand that we have to help, you know, offset the increase of rapid Price. I think I think it's a step in the right direction for mm -hmm. sure, and it's a good idea. The challenge, of course, is can they actually get them built yeah. in t in the timeline that they've set out for themselves? Okay. And I can't remember if it's four years or ten years, but it's whatever it is. It's going to be. That's the challenge. Is mm -hmm. because you have to do all the planning. You have to have the trades. You have to have somebody supply concrete and windows, and like, it, it's not an it's not an easy task. Yeah. I wish it was because we could really use more that homes. that inventory. Yeah. Uh, however, I and it's no fault of anybody's, it's just it's just a fact. I'm not saying oh I'm blaming anybody, it's yeah. just a fact. It just takes time to build stuff, right? True, so true. uh I don't know I think the idea is a good concept. I just don't I I have trouble believing it can actually be executed upon just because of how how what it takes to get stuff built. Okay. And that is going to, again, continually put pressure on. I'm going to go off on a tangent For sure. based on the point you just made. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my own in inquiry, really. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a lot of land at the moment to build on. Mm -hmm. uh, compared to Manhattan, which is another world-class city, we are now becoming a recognized world-class city on yes. a global stage. Uh, so we have America to the south of us, we can't build down south. Mm -hmm. We have protected, la protected lands, the green belts, uh, yes. to the east and northeast of us. Mm -hmm. If we were to even take about 5% of that protected land mm -hmm. to you know, build more homes with close access to the highway, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the interest rates are around the rate it is right now, mm -hmm. do you think that would also help demand or prices? I, I think it would help slow price growth down a bit, yeah. for sure. If you can, anytime you can add supply, okay. it, should, it should technically take some pressure off mm -hmm. prices. And right now, prices are going up too quickly. Yeah. So anytime you can add supply, yes, I think that's a great idea. See, the thing is, is you have to, to kind of match up your, your population growth strategy and your housing strategy. Okay. And right now it's mismatched, mm -hmm. right? They've got, so, they've got a lot of people they want to bring in, but they haven't allowed the housing strategy to catch up. Okay. And so anytime you can close that gap, it's going to take that pressure off, off prices and allow people to kind of catch up and, okay. uh, and be able to afford them. Okay. So the second last question that we have here is um, at the moment, because of the change in the market, there's a cooling off period that we are experiencing right now, March, March 2022, for anybody who wants to know. Uh, <laughs> how long do you think that's going to last? And if there is even a window of it lasting, really? It's a great question, and that we don't really know how long. And, and let's clarify cooling off. Mm -hmm. It also is in certain parts of the market. Mm -hmm. it's, I wouldn't say it's right across the whole market. There's yeah. certain sub-markets that are, are in certain property types that are feeling a little bit of, of which is good, the, pre the pressure is off prices that have just been like yeah. going to the moon, right? So that is happening right now. Again, it's hard to tell. We've got so many things happening right at this moment in time in, our, in and around our world that, are, that I think is causing um, you know, people to say, well, wait a second, let's make sure we don't overextend ourselves, mm -hmm. which I think is a good news story, yeah. right? I think it, we needed that. Uh, and so, you know, in the next few months, things could change. Yeah. But I really do think that it's hard to really time the market per se. Mm -hmm. We like to talk about time in the market. So again, having that long-term view. Yeah. So, you know, every day we get asked, and I know you get asked every day, is it, is it a good time to buy? Yeah. And I always say, well, it depends, right? It just depends on your personal circumstances. That's actually my, my slogan. What are your circumstances? That's like, yeah. exactly right, brilliant, because you really have to determine 
what your personal circumstances are to determine whether now is the right time to buy. Because if you have a long-term view of things and you need somewhere to live, you have yeah. a growing family, or you're, maybe the kids are growing up and they're moving on and you need a smaller place. Well, why keep a big, huge house if you don't need it? So maybe that just, you know, it's not about, oh, am I timing the market correctly? Well, you have personal needs for your personal situation. And if you're making long-term decisions, whether you buy this year or next year, sure, let's say, let's say it slowed down a little bit. Yeah. Well, I could have saved five or 10%. Well, is it really gonna matter 10 years from now when That's you look true. back and the yeah. house is worth 50 or 60 or 70 or 100% more than what you just paid for it? Yeah. And you've enjoyed that house and you've entertained your family and had friends over and celebrations and you needed somewhere to live anyway. Yeah. You're in a great neighborhood, too. right? And yeah. you've paid down the mortgage all through that time period. So you have all these things happening for you. So whether it's slower for a few months or a year or two years, I don't know if it really matters per se if you're thinking long-term in real estate. Yeah, which is the whole point of this conversation, That's generational it. wealth, right? You got it. You, will, you would have to have it for at least your lifetime, yeah. your child's lifetime, and, and hopefully your grandchildren. Matters, right? Hopefully, right? <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. Um, and what the crazy thing is that a lot of people that I've spoken to don't take into consideration or realize is all the activity we've had over the past two years, it was while there was no immigration whatsoever. Yeah. No immigration. So what happens when the immigration comes back in and now we have buyers who have a lot of money from back home or support from family and it's just going to flood the market with more competition. That's right. right. Right? More, more need, right? More, more need. need for housing. More need for housing. Hopefully, those uh, was it 1.5 million homes? Yeah, yeah, yeah come through with ease. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, the last question that we have yeah. is: some may not believe in the benefits of real estate. Sure. They may believe in stocks. Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to uh, avenues to create that wealth. Um, those possibilities, is real estate the best option for you? Generally speaking, obviously each circumstance is different. Absolutely, yeah. and I'm a little biased obviously because yeah. I, 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 you know, we're very involved in real estate. The one, the one difference that I think, uh, I think everybody can agree on is real, with real estate you can get leverage, mm -hmm. right? You can borrow and leverage and in, in, in debt in a healthy type of debt. Good you're debt. Not, good debt, yeah. you're not credit card debt, you're you know, good debt that's, that's appreciating, the, the, the asset will appreciate over time. And that I think is pretty tough to beat from a investment results standpoint. Because mm. if you have $100,000 to buy stocks, you can buy stocks on margin without you know, getting in too complicated about it, but it's very risky. With buying real estate, you can buy, if you have $100,000 and you conservatively buy a $400,000 property with you know 75% leverage, right? Well, now you've got an asset that's $400,000. You've taken $100,000 and you've created an asset of $400,000 that's now appreciating. So the $400,000 asset's appreciating. As we talked about earlier, you're paying down that debt, paying back that debt from day one. Yeah. You're paying it down. And it's very stable debt. So it's not something where the cost of, of borrowing is going to be volatile. Yeah. It's pretty, you know, pretty much you can either lock in the rates or you can get a variable rate, which doesn't generally move too, too much. So it's a pretty comfortable type of leverage. And I think that's the real secret with real estate mm -hmm. is that you have that ability to get healthy debt, healthy leverage. And it compounds, the growth compounds on itself over time. Yeah. So if you apply those two concepts, it, that's why I feel real estate investing is, has a better result. Now, the thing is, you know, you have to, it's like a, it's a business, it's a little business, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a tenant, you have, you know, repairs to make, you have to find a tenant. You, there's more, you buy a stock of, you know, you buy some Apple stock or Royal Bank or whatever you might, you just buy the stock and, that's it. You don't have to think about it. So that's kind of nice too. Real estate, you do have to be a little more involved. So it depends on what your comfort level is. But in terms of total return over time, and again, as long as you're looking long term, 
I think real estate's pretty tough to beat. Thank you very much for your time. I know that you're a My very pleasure. busy person. Thanks for coming. Yeah, Appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. And great uh, questions. Anytime. Hopefully, you can come back. Anytime. Now keep in mind yeah. that you just, uh, this is the last interview before you go on March break, so I hope you and your family have a lot of fun. Thank you. And uh, once again, thank you very much. My pleasure. No problem. Hey guys, I just wanted to take this opportunity to share with you a conversation that I had with a friend and a colleague of mine who is a certified life coach, and she's going to be talking about the other side of purchasing real estate, the psychological side that you need to be prepared for. Let me know what you think. Hi everyone, my name is Aisha. I am a certified life coach with a background in psychology and cognitive science. First, I want to thank Maurice for giving me the opportunity to speak here. I think it is crucial to talk about health and wellness, especially our mental health when it comes to purchasing or investing in real estate, because it involves many areas of our lives. Stress is a huge factor, especially when it comes to making huge financial investments. And purchasing a home is not only a financial investment, it's also a mental investment, physical investment. Let me break that down a little bit. So financially, you know, we got the main part, the financial financial part of it, right? We are investing a lot of money. And for the most part, that's money that we have to borrow, right? So that's already, we already know what we're getting into with that. Um, but I'm here to speak more about behind the scenes and what goes on beyond the financial factor of it. And I'm also going through this as we speak from a consumer's point of view. And the market nowadays is wild, to say the least, um, but especially coming out from a pandemic where we were already subject to so many mental health changes. We have gone through so many things the past two years, and now we're coming out of it into a market that has blown up and it is a tough for a lot of people. I think that for me, the hardest part mentally um, and energetically, my energy has been very drained because of, you know, we're, we're subject to all these bidding wars and, you know, it's, it's taken a lot of energy to look at a lot of houses. You fall in love with something and then it doesn't work out or they want more money, you have to sacrifice something somewhere, right? So for me, that's been very draining because, you know, I'm falling in love with these houses and it's like we have to start the process all over again. A lot of us, I think, also have pressure from our families or culture or society. You know, it's a huge purchase. It's the biggest purchase of our lives. And, you know, we have to make sure that we are paying attention to our mental health and our overall health stability, you know, through all of this, as I said, it affects everything. And it is crucial to pay attention to that because at the end of the day, nothing is worth having if you don't have your health. We can only do our best with what we have, right? But we need to understand where our best is. There has to be a boundary because anything over that boundary is going to sacrifice your health and yourself and your life and your relationships. The physical stress that we might be subjected to is things like you're not just moving from one home to another or down the street, you know, or just in a different neighborhood. With the way the market is now, the prices that, it, that they are in this city, a lot of us are being forced to move out of the city right? To look out of outside of the city. And, you know, that means that we are now having to relocate our jobs um, or having to spend extra time traveling, which is taking away from your own personal time. We're moving farther away from our families. My son has to change schools. Our kids are also going to be going through their own experience of it, right? And so, especially as parents, you know, we've also have to manage their mental health because this is a change for them that they might not quite understand like we do. And it's also important to support them through this transition. So I think a big question when it comes to purchasing or investing in real estate is asking yourself, am I mentally prepared for this? Not only financially, it is not only a financial burden, it is not only a financial uh, stress or a financial commitment, you're also committing your life, your everyday life, you know, your habits, your job, your neighborhood. And you know what? The only way we're really going to be able to find these answers is if we be honest with ourselves. And so this is exactly why I'm here today. Uh, my advice and my reminder for you 
Number one, check in with yourself. Always, always, always check in with yourself and with your partner, okay, or whoever you're purchasing this home with. When we can't manage our own stress, it's tough to manage everything else in life. So check in with each other, be there for each other, support each other, be honest with each other, right? I have to kind of pause and tell my partner, all right, you know what? I know that your stress is most of the time good stress because you're working hard. I appreciate all that, but you know, it's affecting me now. <laughs> and that's a problem for me because now my boundary is being reached and I can't give that much energy. I have to be a mother, right? I have to take care of myself. I have to take care of my son and my family. So I need to hold myself to a certain standard because I can't, I can't give everything and sacrifice myself in the meantime. I also want to put in a little reminder there that doing your best does not always mean doing the most. Which brings me to number two, identify your boundaries, identify your personal boundaries, even with your partners. You know, like, as I said, with my partner, he's on it all day. And for me, I cannot spend that much energy on it. I, I, I mentally cannot. Number three, identify areas of concern, not just financially, which is a big part, not just financially, but everything in life. Identify all areas of concern that you need to work on, how you can be a better person. We should be doing this with everything in life, right? How can I do better in my life? Because there's always room to grow. There's always things to learn. And it is very crucial to keep on that path and always, again, checking in with yourself, seeing where you are and making sure you're on the right track. And my last and final point is that nothing is worth having if you're sacrificing your health. If we don't pay attention to what's happening inside of us or how we're doing, we are going to suffer in the long run and you're not going to be able to enjoy anything you have in life, let alone enjoy yourself. So with that, I wish you the best of luck and I hope you take such good care of yourself so that you can enjoy everything life has to offer.